He is the host of Lakers Nation and the NBA Front Office Show on YouTube. We welcome back Trevor Lane onto Hoopsology. How's it going, Trevor? Doing well, doing well. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on to the show. We really enjoyed, you know, you your first appearance on our podcast, and what a difference like two years makes in terms of what's what's happened since then. And I just want to kind of you know pick your brain, of course, about the Los Angeles Lakers and see if you can kind of give us just kind of a overall layout as to really really happened with them this season, as a lot of NBA pundits had them as the a clear title contender. And I want to go to one of your recent tweets just about the season. Um, it says, quote, no silver lining. The off season starts now and the Lakers have no margin for error. First step is to figure out which past sense could be undone and at what cost then build from there. Can you just elaborate on that? And do you think um, the Lakers front office has um, taken you know, heed to your advice? Because I think that's just perfect in terms of what they need to do to make sure this season doesn't happen again in kind of future iterations of this team. Yeah, I mean, I've been calling this the worst Lakers season ever. Um, Record-wise, it's not true, but it, relative to expectations and just the fan experience this season – it, it was absolutely awful. I mean, even game to game, the, the game script was terrible. I mean, Lakers fans started talking about what, what became known as the fake comeback, where we knew each game the Lakers were going to come back into a game just not enough to take a lead, but just enough to get your hopes up and then crush you again as the, the other <laughs> team would usually surge right back ahead. So that was that was kind of the, the experience for Lakers fans this, this season. So it was extremely difficult. Um as far as what they need to do and, and can they actually pull all, all of this off? I mean, you look at the moves that they made last off season, there were some question marks about whether or not it would work. Ultimately it was a gamble on talent, uh, ultimately outweighing fit, right? That was, that was what the Lakers were gambling on last season. And then there's the age element that's mixed into that. And none of that worked. The, the older players didn't work out. The, uh, the fit concerns were very real. And in fact, they were even greater, I think, than anybody predicted. Even the people who were saying this isn't going to work couldn't have predicted that it would uh, not work to the degree that it did. So it's undoing some of the stuff that you did last season. Of course, people will look at Russell Westbrook, and that's that's important. But then it's also the mindset, the type of players that you're targeting. The Lakers were so hell-bent last season on finding three-point shooters, finding spacing, and they shot terribly against the Phoenix Suns in the first round of the NBA playoffs the prior season and so it made sense but we saw an overcorrection where they focused so much on just can a guy shoot that they didn't look at what else a player could do and as a result they had a roster full of guys that could either shoot and not defend or defend and not shoot and it just made for a really really difficult mix so are they going to fix that and go back to the previous roster builds that we saw actually win an NBA championship in 2019 and 2020 and find guys that are two-way players ideally a little bit younger a little bit more spring in their step You've got a guy that shoots 35% from three but can defend. Give me that guy all day, every day, over a guy who shoots 41% from three and can't defend. Uh, so will the Lakers kind of switch up their, their thinking in terms of the type of players that they target? And then ultimately, what do they do with Russell Westbrook? Undoing that mistake is going to be costly, and the path that they choose there could impact the franchise for the next eight years. I mean, when we're talking about the 2027, 2029 pick potentially being involved, we're looking pretty far down the road here. So what the choices that they make this summer are going to be extremely important for the franchise's future. Go ahead, Justin. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask a follow-up to that. You mentioned mm -hmm. the, the Lakers team that won the title in the bubble. And I, to me, I think that's one of the most difficult seasons in NBA history. I know some people have asterisks by that title, but I quite think the opposite in terms of the extenuating circumstance that team had to go um, to, to win that championship. What caused such a dramatic course correction in terms of, you know, using that blueprint that won the Lakers, that NBA title under extreme circumstances, and all of a sudden going in a totally different direction that I think a lot of pundits saw this possibly cannot work. Like, I think there's a lot of skeptics. I think well, there's a lot of people out there thinking the Lakers could be the title favorites. There's still a lot of skepticism in terms of the additions of Melo and Westbrook and the future of Anthony Davis and, you know, LeBron's age and, you know, sprinkling that into this concoction that ended up being the, the Lakers um, <laughs> past season here. So what did the front office, like, what was their mindset in terms of moving from this blueprint that won them the championship to, you know, this disaster of a season that we, we, we witnessed, excuse me? 
so I think there, there's two specific things that won out in terms of creating the Lakers team the way that they did and why they went away from what they had previously. And the first one is is finding a replacement for LeBron whenever he is out. And that has been a problem for the Lakers since literally the day he came in. We've seen the Lakers, whenever LeBron is on the bench, things fall apart, right? The offense falls to pieces. It was always a question of, can they just hang on, just stay even with their opponent until LeBron comes back and then they can surge ahead and get a lead? We saw way too often LeBron would, would be in, the Lakers would get a lead, the bench would come in, LeBron would get a rest, and the lead would, would disappear, and then LeBron would come back in, knock the lead back up, say five, six points, LeBron takes a rest, and, and, and it's just this, this yo-yo effect that just goes back and forth. Um, and so the Lakers wanted to mitigate that. Uh, they also wanted to take a little bit of, of the burden off of, of LeBron James, so he didn't have to do all of the playmaking and all of that, especially given the fact that he's you know getting up there in, in years and everything. So it, it makes sense on paper, and they tried to do that with Dennis Schroeder the, the season before, was give LeBron somebody else that could run the offense, somebody else that could initiate things. So it wasn't all on LeBron like it was in 2019-2020. They just went to a further degree with Russell Westbrook. They decided, okay, Dennis Schroeder, this didn't work for a lot of reasons. We still want to try to check that box of having somebody who can run the offense when LeBron is not on the floor, who can keep things afloat. Russell Westbrook, former MVP, that's got to be that guy. And then I think we get into another topic in terms of why you go for a Russell Westbrook instead of a game manager, instead of finding kind of a mid-tier guard, even – you know, even just somebody that can come in and just eat some minutes for you. Um, the reason why they they have this appeal of going with Russell Westbrook is it goes back to the original blueprint for this team. The team that won a championship was not the team that they wanted to have. Their ideal situation was to have LeBron, Anthony Davis, and Kawhi Leonard. Now, obviously, that didn't work out. But even, even before that, the goal wasn't even a big two, uh, a superstar duo, which I think that's more the direction the NBA is starting to head. That's a different conversation, though. But you go back even further, and the Lakers were looking at LeBron, the pieces to trade for Anthony Davis, and Paul George, right? I mean, that was the the initial thought of building out this Lakers team. So having three stars is a concept that has been around the Lakers for a while. And since they got LeBron, it's been part of their plan. And so I think you've got both of those things coming into play. Russell Westbrook being a guy who, in theory, can keep you afloat whenever LeBron's not on the floor. Didn't work out that way, but that was the thought process. And then also checking that box of having three superstars and building around that, and that being the original idea behind the formation of this team, even though going away from that, not by choice, ultimately won them an NBA championship. So I think it's those two things that they came into play that ultimately caused the Lakers to make the decisions that they made. And of course we know it did not work at all. So there, there's a lot to touch on with this Lakers team, but I, I wanted your perspective as someone who covers the Lakers directly. What do you feel has been most misunderstood about this team over the past year, or maybe just a couple things that have been very misunderstood? I mean, we've, we've had narratives like, um, you know, the Lakers went away from their defensive identity, or this is Russell Westbrook's fault. He's kind of the scapegoat here, um, or maybe something else in entirely that you've seen over the past year covering this team what do you feel is not understood about this team or, or maybe just a false narrative that's been put out there sure I mean I think that the idea that it is all Russ's fault is is incorrect he's a mm. big part of it and it makes sense why he would be sort of the symbol of the, this downturn right because he was the big move and the decision that was made was so loud and so very clearly controversial and then I mean it, it was such an, an epic failure. I mean, catastrophic. Can't, can't think of very many situations like this where they have, have kind of shot themselves in the foot. They've made decisions that ultimately led to their own demise. So Russell Westbrook, he's part of the problem. But if you look at, and I've said this many, many times over the course of the season, if you picked any one thing and said, that's the Lakers problem, that is a very, very narrow view of what's going on and just an incorrect understanding. If it's if you're saying it's all Russell Westbrook's fault, Frank Vogel's fault, the front office's fault, injuries' fault, COVID, COVID fault, Anthony Davis, whatever you want to point to, if you're going to point to any singular thing that doesn't truly look at what really happened with the, this Lakers season, which was a perfect storm 
of a lot of different things coming together to create these problems. So I think that, and Russ took a lot of heat, and there's obviously a back and forth between Russell Westbrook and Lakers fans. They did not get along very well for various reasons, but um, he's part of the problem. He's not the whole problem. And so I think that's certainly a, an incorrect narrative. But the other one that I, that I see a lot is people saying, well, the Lakers have no draft picks. The Lakers have, there's no picks coming up, mm. which is not true. Um, it's just incorrect. They don't have picks to trade until 2027 and 2029. Uh, but that's because of something called the Stepien rule. That doesn't mean they don't have future picks. So, they actually have a pick next year. They've got their first round pick next year. There's a pick swap that's in place with the Pelicans, but that could be something. It could also be nothing. It could, it could have no value depending on where the Lakers and the Pelicans uh, finish the season in, in relation to each other. Then 2024 or 2025 will go to the Pelicans and the other one stays with the Lakers. So you're talking about in terms of what's left, you've got one pick swap next year, which still means you'll have a first round pick no matter what you've got a first next year. And then, one out of 2024 or 2025 would go to the Pelicans, and that's it. You know, 2026 they still have all their picks from there on. They they still have now. Again, if you are looking at maybe heading into a post LeBron period, it would certainly be better if they had all of their picks. It's the number eight overall this year that goes to the Pelicans. That definitely hurts. But this idea that the Lakers are completely locked into this team and simply have no picks is incorrect not just from a draft pick perspective, but also if you look at their salary situation, this can change a lot this year, but they actually have a ton of cap space in 2023 right now. I mean, just insane amounts of money that they could potentially use to pivot very quickly should they decide to um, next summer. So they are very, very much not locked into this team and there is future flexibility built in as of right now. Again, maybe that changes after the moves they make this summer, but, uh, but they're, they're not locked in to the squad that they've got at the moment. Do you see the the future goal shifting a, away from that three-star model, given how this season turned out? Or, I mean, obviously so much of this depends on the individual stars themselves and who you're talking about. Um, but could you see, you know, just clearing that cap space with maybe Westbrook um, and just trying to build a very deep roster around LeBron and Anthony Davis, which of, of course worked in 2020, or do you see the the goalposts kind of changing given how this season wound up? No, I, I think that we're in the midst of a, of a league wide shift away from the big three concept. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen that happen. And I think the Lakers were kind of the early adopters of it accidentally and then went away from it uh, in 2019, 2020. But the Lakers found in that 2019, 2020 season that if you have a roster with depth and with guys who, number one, have chemistry, and number two, they all understand their roles and they can execute those roles in order to become greater than the sum of their parts, that's better, actually, than having three stars. Because inevitably what happens with three stars is there's only one basketball. One of those stars is going to wind up being the third fiddle, despite how talented they are they're not going to produce at a star level. And we see that historically. There, like, there are some situations where they, they can produce at a high level still, and you can have that guy to lean upon when need be, but having three guys all going off at the same time in the same game, that's very, very difficult to achieve. So we're seeing teams switch towards, let's do what the Lakers did in 2019, 2020. Again, not by choice, but they built on a roster that was very deep, that had pieces that fit, they had that chemistry. They had that identity as well, which is something that I thought the Lakers this season lacked. And so I think that's something that I would like to see them go back to. I think the league in general is pushing towards right now that one or two stars and then building around them with the right pieces. That's becoming a bigger, bigger concept. You look at the Miami Heat. I mean, look at the teams that are left right now. The Boston Celtics, the Miami Heat. Heck, the, the Mavs are a one-star team, really. They're, they've got this heliocentric identity around around uh around luca and then you've got of course the golden state warriors you could say well i mean steph curry is a star draymond is he there clay i mean you could argue maybe they are the not quite the, the best example of it but three of the four teams that are left are built around one or two stars and they're still standing because of the depth that they've got the roles that they've got and the buy-in that they've got across their roster and i think there's a, a league-wide understanding that those things are more important than having three star level players together. 
No, I love this. I, th- I think this is such a great point. And you look at like the Brooklyn Nets as well uh, with, with how that whole situation played out and those guys looking invincible at the start of things when the three of them were out there and then, you know, a uh, whole lot of uh, chaos ensues and we only get, I believe it was 16 games of those three playing together on the court at the same time. Uh, we had an episode actually about three weeks ago where we sort of explored like the last 20 years of teams and talked about maybe the two superstars model is a better way to go just because of the depth of the roster you're able to build around those guys. And like you point out there, I mean, things can be really volatile when you are putting so much usage rate dependence and other factors on only three guys on your roster. So I, I love all these points. Um, I wanted to ask you about Frank Vogel specifically and maybe more internally what was going on there. Was there a sense of him losing the rock locker room? And of course, any time that you have high expectations and there's a lot of losing going on, uh, things are going to be tense to say the least, but do you feel that there's almost been too much sympathy given to Frank Vogel in terms of um, just shifting away from that defensive identity? Or is that a, a fair defense of Frank Vogel? No, I think it's fair. I mean, if you were to, like when you're looking at the roster moves the Lakers made, none of them really sound like Frank Vogel moves. None of those sound like moves that would help him run a team the way he wants to. Contrary to the 2019-2020 team, when you look at the pieces on that roster, you think, man, a defense-first head coach is going to love this team because they've got all these great defensive pieces. Instead, they completely went away from that, and the response from the Lake, I mean, they were asked about this directly, and Rob Rob Palenka just said, well, we've got a really good defensive coach. So in other words, Frank Vogel, we gave you all these guys who aren't good defenders. It's on you to fix this, to figure it out, piece it together. You're really good at this, so here you go. Now, you can say that maybe Frank Vogel didn't do a good enough job getting the most out of the players that he had on the roster or adapting to the players that that are on the roster, and I think that's fair. But I also think it's fair to say the Lakers didn't do him any kind of service here with the roster that they put together in terms of fitting his own style. That's not necessarily a unique thing in the NBA, though typically NBA coaches are expected to adapt to the players on their roster and not vice versa. But it's still it's still worth noting that this was not a team that was put together to really thrive under Frank Vogel. And I think the Lakers weren't too concerned with putting together a team for Frank Vogel. They only gave him a one-year contract extension last summer. He had won an NBA championship, had a really good season last year, too, that was uh, derailed by injuries. I mean, very clearly, when they were healthy, they were one of the best teams in the league, and they just couldn't get healthy. That was, that was the big problem the previous season. So you had Frank Vogel, who had... The team looking really well when they were healthy. And then the season before that won a championship and the Lakers said, "Eh, we're only going to give you a year. I think they had already questioned whether or not Frank Vogel was going to be around much longer. And so they weren't too concerned about whether or not the pieces would necessarily fit for his style. And we're hoping he could figure out a way to adapt. So I I think it's fair to say that Frank Vogel, while I don't think he helped things enough this season, I also don't think he's the entire problem or anything like that. I don't think you can point to him and say, oh, if they just had a different coach, Everything would have been fine. No, I still think Frank Vogel is a good coach. Got kind of stuck in a, in a bad situation and then couldn't do enough to improve upon that situation with the pieces that he was given. Trevor, I want to shift gears to LeBron. And I just want to ask you kind of the same question, but from two different perspectives. Um, just due to how badly this season went for the Lakers, in terms of – his perception with Laker fans and then his, his overall perception through just the rest of the league. How do you think his legacy is going to be affected moving forward, either positively or negatively? So for Lakers fans, um, there's always been this kind of strange dynamic with Lakers fans and, and LeBron where they've kind of kept them at arm's distance. Um, that's eroded a little bit over the years, but I, I guesstimated that when LeBron first signed with the Lakers, about half of Lakers fans were excited, at least from what I saw. About half of Lakers fans were excited. Half of Lakers fans were upset. Didn't want LeBron on the Lakers. He had been the enemy for so long, and you know LeBron versus Kobe and, and all of those things. Um, and, and so that kind of undercurrent was has, has always been has always been there. Um, as seasons went on and LeBron's out there and he's scoring and getting triple doubles and doing and winning a championship that started to go away. But then now that we've had 
LeBron suffering injuries and things like that. And then the stuff about it was LeBron that pushed for Russell Westbrook to be on the team. So there was a lot of frustration with that as well. And so a lot of Lakers fans are looking at the situation and they're, if LeBron does right by the team, and that means either either winning more, coming, you know, he comes back next season and they're able to win, or he tells the team, look, I'm not planning on staying. Let's work on a trade situation and you can get something back. I think Lakers fans would be okay at that point. What fans don't want to see happen, and there's a lot of caution here about this, a lot of trepidation, is that the Lakers this summer do everything they can to appease LeBron James. 2027 first, 2029 first, gone take on a bunch of salary to eliminate some of that future flexibility, all of those things. And then you wind up with an, another injury March season for LeBron this next season. The team doesn't win a championship again. They, you know, Maybe they barely squeak into the playoffs or something. You have another rough season. And then he leaves in 2023, and you're left with what's left. You know, you're limited assets moving forward. You've taken on salary, and the team is kind of left in shambles as, as LeBron sails out of town and goes somewhere else. That's the the concern from Lakers fans that are causing them to kind of question everything that LeBron is doing. I think if LeBron says, no, I'm staying here, signs a new contract extension, um, they figure out a way to land the right kind of pieces, LeBron distances himself from the decision, but you know, whatever it is, I think all of those things would kind of help smooth things over with fans. But right now, there's a lot of concern about if LeBron does what's best for LeBron right now, what is that going to mean for the Lakers which is what most you know, Lakers fans care about, is the franchise itself into the future. So there's that dynamic that, that's playing out right now that I'm seeing among the, among Lakers fans. And I want to ask you about Anthony Davis as well. Um, going to that point of Lakers fans, what is their frustration level with him in terms of his injury woes? Are Is it kind of reaching a boiling point in terms of just wanting to move on from him, or do they still see the potential what he can bring to the Lakers in the future? No, the frustration is extremely high. Um, we haven't seen, I mean, we saw the Anthony Davis at an MVP level in the 2019-2020 playoffs. He was absolutely phenomenal. And we haven't seen him touch that level since then. Uh, the previous season, again, all kinds of injuries, 2020-2021 uh, injuries, and didn't play as well this season. Again, injuries, spent about half the season injured, had two major injuries this year. Uh the, I guess the counter argument is, and Anthony Davis has mentioned this himself, you look at his two main injuries this year, both of them were kind of fluky things. Where I mean, like, if he was jogging down the court and his quad tears or something like that, just running down the floor, you could say, okay, well, that's an injury-prone prone player. This past season, he had a guy fall into his knee, and he landed on Rudy Gobert's foot. I mean, these are things that, that could happen anyway, just happened to Anthony Davis. Um Regardless, though, the bottom line is that for Lakers fans, you're playing these games and he's not out there. He's not on the floor, regardless of the reason, whether it's his fault or, or not, that the injury occurred. He has gotten injured. And so a lot of fans are frustrated. I've seen some fans that are saying, well, you need to you need to trade him. Trade him right now. It's never going to get better. He's always going to be hurt. He's not a 1A guy anyway, even when he's healthy. Let's move on. LeBron's going to leave eventually anyway get something for Anthony Davis and let's, and let's move on while he still has value. The ups, the other side is saying, well, AD when he's good is probably a lot better than anything you're going to get in a trade for him when he's performing at his best, when he is healthy. So if you're the Lakers and you're looking at ceiling and you're looking at if we're healthy for the playoffs, can, can we win a championship? You probably have a better chance of doing that with Anthony Davis on your roster than not. So there's a divide, but I can tell you the frustration is, is 100% growing. Um, it's look, Anthony Davis needs to have a season where he spends most of it on the floor and a season where he's good. I mean, he shot what, like 18% from three this past season. He not only when he not only was he not on the floor enough, but when he was on the floor, he wasn't the guy that he used to be. And so there's a lot riding on this next season for Anthony Davis, and there's a lot of concern right now among Lakers fans. Yeah, I do wonder how many of the the problems we've been discussing go away if you have both LeBron and AD on the court for, you know, 60 plus games this season. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, I, I'm sure you you read the LA Times Bill Plaschke interview uh, with Jeannie Buss. How confident are you and how confident are fans in management 
um, being able to handle the challenges facing the Lakers, you know, moving into this off season? Um, I would say not, not super confident, but it's not, it's not necessarily an indictment of, of them. I think they're in a very difficult spot. Um, I sure. think that most teams around the NBA are looking at the Lakers saying, okay, this team is desperate. They have to move Russell Westbrook. They have to fix these problems right now. Let's fleece them. I think that's what we saw at the trade deadline uh, this past season. You saw any teams that wanted to get involved in trade negotiations with, negotiations with the Lakers were teams that were looking to um, to put one over on them in terms of, of trades. I, I mean, as they should. They, that's the way the NBA works. Leverage is an important thing, and I don't think the Lakers have a lot of it going into this offseason. So with that being the case, and then the fact that you've got Russell Westbrook under contract for $47 million, it doesn't seem like bringing him back is – really a, a possibility. I mean, we're, we're hearing stuff that maybe they really will bring him back, but it's not going to be easy to move him. It wasn't a clear fit on paper. It was an even worse fit when he got actually out on the floor with this Lakers team. And so it feels like they need to move on from him. If nothing else, then just to clear the air and kind of refresh things and have a, a clean slate and, and start over this next season. But actually accomplishing that is going to be difficult. And then when you look at the salary situation that they're in, in terms of not having cap space, you're talking about, as of right now, they've got a taxpayer mid-level exception of about $6 million that you can use to go bring somebody in, and then a bunch of veteran minimums. And who knows what's going to happen with Malik Monk if he gets an offer bigger than the taxpayer mid-level. One of the main bright spots of the season could be walking out the door. So I'm not saying I, I don't believe Rob Blinken can do it. You know, it wasn't that long ago when we stepped back when the Lakers were being tabbed as not only were they the reigning champions, but they were voted – as the team who had improved the most over the offseason, when they added Dennis Schroeder and they added Montrezl Harrell and Marcus Saul and, and Wesley Matthews, they had added these pieces. So I think this front office can get the job done, but you have to question their decision making after what we saw this past season. You have to question are there too many cooks in the kitchen? We talk about Phil Jackson, Magic Johnson, all these other individuals getting involved in the decision making process. And then just the the logistics of trying to make a deal given the restrictions that are on the team right now, given the environment, the rest of the league seeing them as desperate. Is it easy to make a trade with that situation? Is it easy to, to make moves when you don't really have money to go spend in free agency? That's where it's going to be difficult to really turn things around. So not only do you have the questions about how competent is this front office, and I think they are more so than Lakers fans give them credit for, but the environment that they're stepping into this summer is not going to be an easy one. They have to get everything right if they're going to fix this. And so, I mean, this is you're, you're got you've got three minutes left in the fourth quarter, and you're down ten. That's essentially where the Lakers are at right now. You've got to play mistake-free basketball for the entire time if you're going to be able to get a win here. So we'll see what what they can ultimately do, but uh, it's going to be an uphill climb. Trevor, I wanted to ask you about the Lakers coaching search, I believe. Um, I saw a poll on your Twitter page in terms of um, the majority of people were, were picking um, Darvin Ham as the kind of a, their preferred choice. Um, I know Terry Stotts and Kenny Atkinson are also in the running for that job. He can assess who would be kind of the, the best man for the job moving forward. And do you think um, whoever it is, like, what, <laughs> what best advice can you give them just stepping into this potential kind of landmine situation? Um, it, I, ideally, it's the Lakers. It's a high, very high-profile job. However, they have a lot of problems right now, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because the three candidates are so different in terms of what they bring to the table. Um, I saw something recently, too. Uh, Adam Zagoria put out that uh, that Rob Palenka at the draft combine was meeting with Nets GM Sean Marks. Maybe he's, he's asking him about Kenny Atkinson. This is me guessing, but probably getting a little intel on, uh, on Kenny Atkinson. Um, so you look at Kenny Atkinson, he's seen as a player development guy, uh, pretty kind of a no-nonsense type of type of guy. And so you've got that dynamic because you've got to have somebody who's going to command the respect of LeBron and Anthony Davis. If you don't have that, well, you're probably done before you even start, right? So can that coach bring that, that to the locker room? That's going to be important. I think Kenny Atkinson is interesting in that way. But he's seen as more of a player development guy. So is that a guy that can come in and boost up the few young players that they've got, your Taylor Horton Tucker, your Stanley Johnson, uh, Austin Reeves, Quentin Gabriel, these guys, can they come in and give you a little bit more depth, a little bit more punch? 
uh, in terms of your depth pieces with Kenny Atkinson at the helm. That's something to consider if you're the Lakers. And then you've got Terry Stotts, the veteran head coach, has been to the playoffs a bunch of times, been to the Western Conference Finals, found success with the Blazers, pretty creative offensive mind. The Lakers have not been good offensively in recent seasons. We've seen a lot of stagnation from them, which wasn't a surprise with Frank Vogel. Offense isn't known as being his forte, but there's question marks about Stotts defensively. Um, and do you really want to go with what's seen as a retread coach in a league that has been changing so quick? I mean, you look at the way basketball was played 10 years ago compared to the way it's played now. It's very, very different. So do you want someone with some fresh ideas coming in? Not that Terry Stotts can't adapt to the new NBA or hasn't adapted to the new NBA, but I think sometimes you come in with a different mindset if you go with a, a younger coach who hasn't doesn't already have 20 years of NBA experience under their belt. Uh, but, of course, that experience, like you mentioned, the Lakers – situation i mean if you are stepping into the lakers environment with the spotlight with the pressure of fixing all of this can a first year head coach like darvin ham handle that and he's very well respected around the nba a lot of people see him as somebody who already should have been a head coach and so i understand why lakers fans are on board with him right i mean he's he's the new hotness here right he is he is the shiny new toy everybody knows what terry stotts does people have an idea of what kenny atkinson does but you've kind of got got the mystery box here with with Darvin Ham, where he's well respected, and you're seeing success with other teams with first year head coaches. You look at what uh, it wasn't his first year this year, but Taylor Jenkins and in Memphis that he did a fantastic job. Uh, he was new when he first came on board with them. Email Odoka, of course, with the Boston Celtics. So I think there's a lot of Lakers fans that are looking at this and saying, you know what, Terry Stotts, we know what he does, that's fine, but is that getting us where we want to go? Kenny Atkinson, is that getting us where we want to go? Not sure. Probably have a lower floor with Darvin Ham and, and the question marks about can he really handle this position? We don't know. But that unknown creates that ceiling, too, where you're wondering, can this guy really come in with a bunch of new ideas, a bunch of energy, and put the team over the top? What I've seen a lot of is Lakers fans want Darvin Ham with experienced veteran assistants, guys who maybe have had head coach, or maybe you convinced Terry Stotts to be an assistant. And that would be your ideal combination. Uh, kind of similar to what the Brooklyn Nets did with Steve Nash and Mike D'Antoni on as an assistant, doing something like that. But that's that's where things are at, which direction the Lakers will ultimately go. I don't know. I think all three are quality candidates, but very clearly Lakers fans want it to be Darvin Ham that gets the nod. Trevor, this has been an amazing chat. Thank you very much for coming on to the show. Can you please let our listeners and viewers know where they can find you on social media? Again, the um, podcast you host, any other projects you're working on uh, for the rest of the year as well. Sure, yeah. You can find me at Trevor underscore Lane on Twitter, at Trevor Lane NBA on Instagram and Facebook. Most of my work goes up over on the Lakers Nation YouTube channel. We do Lakers videos there uh, every single day. We've got the Lakers Nation podcast, which can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And those go out consistently throughout the week. So you can take Lakers Nation with you wherever you want to go. And then, of course, all of our written work goes up over at LakersNation.com. Appreciate the chat, Trevor. Thank you very much. Oh, sure thing. No problem. Thank you for having me.